Buonasera. Good evening. I am Paola Cordone. I am the newly appointed director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Amsterdam. This evening, I have the pleasure to present an event which celebrates the European Landscape Convention signed in Florence in the year 2000. Well, this event was supposed to take place last year, but we all know why we had to postpone it. The convention promotes the protection, management and planning of landscapes, as well as international cooperation on landscape issues. It is important to stress that landscape issues influence our well-being enormously because they are tightly linked to climate change, social change, economical development, biodiversity. So they are extremely important for our lifestyle and our health. I have the pleasure to present uh, this evening two speakers who will talk about these issues, talking uh, about two types of approach. The landscape architect, Hanneke Keine, director of the Department of Landscape Architecture of the Academy of, Am of Architecture of Amsterdam, whom I thank very much for joining this event. And the landscape designer, Gianluca Tramutola, who is guest teacher at the Academy of Architecture of Amsterdam. So I will start by giving him the floor. I thank you all for being with us this evening. And uh, should you wish to ask questions, feel free to do so with the chat of the, through the chat of the event. Uh, according to the timing, I am sure that our guests will do their best to reply to some of them. So I will give the floor to Gianluca and thank you everybody for being with us. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Paola, for introducing uh, us and above all to uh, host uh, this presentation at the Italian Cultural uh, Institute. I thank uh, Anke Kain uh, very much for being here and to give a Dutch contribution to this uh, event. Um, I do have quite a long presentation, so I will not uh, use too much time uh, in this introduction, but I will be pleased to answer your uh, questions later. So I will start with my presentation. Ok, so Nuovi Paesaggi, uh, it's a, an interesting title, uh, New Landscapes, and with a big red question mark. The red question mark is actually the point of this uh, uh, presentation and this cultural uh, event. Uh, as the director already uh, told you, we are celebrating actually a little bit later, the 20th anniversary of the European Landscape Convention, which is a document uh, signed in uh, Florence by the Council of Europe. And uh, it is a document, a policy that meant a lot for the European countries because uh, for the first time, all the European countries recognize together the value of uh, European landscapes for their identity, for their values, and uh, yeah, with all the, the consequences and issues uh, mainly concerning uh, transformations. Uh, what is important about this convention is that really address the fact that everybody is responsible in the protection, management and planning. So whatever uh, you do in your life, we are all responsible for the place where we do live. Tonight, we are going to talk about Puglia, which is one of the regions of Italy, as you can see in the, in the map. Um, here are some data about the, the region, as you can see, uh, it's quite a large region, uh, especially compared to the Netherlands. It's almost, I would say, almost south of the Netherlands. Uh, very much deep in the south and in the Mediterranean. Um, unfortunately, although Puglia is a very beautiful region, uh, we will uh, talk tonight about a problem that is affecting uh, the landscapes of uh, Puglia. 
Uh, Puglia is very much famous all over the world for the beautiful uh, rural landscapes and, and especially for the relationship between the countryside and the urban settings, like you see here in the village of uh, Locorotondo. Well, if you would have arrived in the airport of Brindisi at the beginning of uh, last year, you would have seen these both these two images. Uh, this is to say that this uh, story I'm going to talk about is very much related also to the pandemic we are facing uh, nowadays. So I will avoid uh, making reference to the COVID, but you will see that with uh, what I will tell you, there are a lot of similarities in these two sad uh, events affecting uh, our lives. So Puglia is, uh, is very famous for the ancient olive trees. Olive trees are, I would say, the, the trees that mainly uh, represent the identity of this region. Sadly enough, uh, in 2012, uh, we noticed that some olive trees started to die. Um, Eventually, in 2013, it was discovered that the, the reason why those uh, trees were dying, scientists from uh, Puglia and from uh, CNR, uh, Donato Bosch and uh, Maria Saponari mainly, they discovered the presence of a bacterium. Uh, this bacterium is called uh, Xylella fastidiosa, and it's one of the most dangerous plant bacterium in the world. Uh, it has a quarantine uh, status within the EU, so it's very much recognized internationally that it's a very dangerous bacterium. Uh, and it affects a lot of plants. Uh, the problem affecting the olive groves in Puglia is one of the most severe and urgent landscape issue of the entire Mediterranean area. But what it's uh, this disease is uh, it's a problem because in Puglia the the landscape developed in a in a special way, and I will uh, tell you about that later. But the problem of this uh, bacterium and of this plant disease is very much related to monocultures. Monocultures are very fragile agro ecosystems. In the history of the European agriculture and landscape development, we already faced two or many other uh, problems related to monoculture. I address here the, the problem with the vineyard, with the phylloxera and the potato uh, blight, both uh, very uh, strong diseases that caused big huge damages in the landscapes and the, in the economies of many countries. Uh, especially the phylloxera really destroyed the European uh, vineyards for many uh, decades. And the potato uh, blight caused a great famine in Ireland. Everybody knows almost 1 million people died and a lot of Irish people were uh, migrated to the USA in order to find a better uh, place to live. Um, what we see now with the uh, Xylella fastidiosa, as you can see, most of this disease come from other uh, regions in the world. So we import diseases, we import plants uh, together. Uh, the bacterium that is affecting the olive trees in, uh, in Puglia comes probably from uh, Costa Rica where it was found on coffee plants. So wh what is the reason for this presentation? Personally, I really felt uh, already two years ago when I started asking the Italian Cultural Institute to do this presentation, to raise concern, care and awareness about this problem. Because it's uh, since 2013, this, the olive trees of Puglia are dying and dramatically among the most beautiful European rural landscapes are going through traumatic transformations with a total uncertain future. 
But uh, my story actually starts very uh, long ago because uh, we said that in 2000 year, the European Landscape Conventions was signed. But in 2010, uh, I first did my first presentation at the Italian Cultural Institute. And in that, uh, during that presentation, I talked about the uh, identity of the stone landscapes of the region Puglia. So there my story about Puglia started. In 2015, I talked about the invisible landscapes, talking about perception of landscapes. Today, I'm talking to you again about Puglia, about the transformation of the landscape. So as you can see, uh, we celebrated always the European Landscape Convention every five years with three different uh, topics related to landscape that are very important. So identity, perception, and transformation. Puglia was always present in this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this is the content of my uh, presentation tonight. I will talk, I will start talking about the devastation of the olive groves and the transformations. So I told you in 2013, the scientists first discovered the bacterium south of the city of Gallipoli. Uh, the bacterium is, uh, is transferred from uh, uh, an infected tree to another via a vector that is a, a spittle bug, Philemus uh, spumarius. Uh, so very uh, fastly actually, um, this bacterium spread all over the province of Lecce and now is moving north. Uh, so as you can see, uh, I will not talk tonight about the infection, about the bacterium because scientists uh, are already specialized in this. I'm talking to you as a landscape designer and agronomist. So all that you need to know about the bacterium and the infection, you can find it on the internet and through uh, more uh, experienced person. But it's, uh, it's worth to say that, uh, this, uh, that there is no method available to cure this uh, disease and that the control strategy has to focus on the insect vector and on the removal of infected plants that uh, if left on the field can act as reservoir for the bacterium inoculum. And this is also stated by the European Food Safety Authority. So uh, what happened in the last years that uh, the trees started to die with the control measures, infected trees had to be cut. Uh, it is a very complex problem. Uh, and during the years, uh, a lot has happened, a lot of reactions, as you can imagine. Also reactions that were, you know, uh, normal somehow, you know, because people were facing something totally new. Um, I must say critically that there's been also an initial distrust in science, discontinuity in decision-making and dialogue, judicial inquiries, sequestration of olive trees, court appeals, bureaucracy, anger and despair. The result is that we lost a lot of beautiful trees because the olive trees of Puglia are mainly very old olive trees, like typical of the Italian um, landscape characterized by the olive groves. These olive trees you can see here are just very close to the city of uh, Lecce. Uh, I told you about the monoculture problem. Here you can see from these beautiful uh, maps of the provincial territorial plan by architect Paolo Viganò that uh, the landscape, the territory of Salento is actually a big forest of olive trees. So a big, huge monocultures. Until now, uh, at least 8 million trees have died. But if you travel through Salento, it's just one big cemetery of olive trees uh, nowadays. Um, it is a pity because we in Puglia, we recognize the value of this tree. The regional government made a law in 2007 to protect the ancient olive trees. These trees are a piece of art. They are like sculptures. You know, I show you here the, 
uh, this beautiful sculpture of Bernini, which is one of my favorite. Keep in mind that many of these trees, uh, while Bernini was sculpting these uh, sculptures, those trees were planted. In 2015, I did this exhibition about invisible landscapes, about landscape perception, and the olive trees of Salento were one of my uh, cases that I showed, you know, predicting that would, those trees would disappear. In fact, after five years, almost six, I can say that this is actually, unfortunately, what happened. So we are losing an heritage, environmental heritage, trees, beauty, and the history of our territory. But the actual damage related to the trees, to the loss of the trees, is only one of the many damages because we face nowadays and for the future uncertainty with environmental problems because an uh, olive tree's forest is dying with all the consequences. Of course, economic problems, production uh, for plant nurseries and all the other activities landscape and cultural uh, nature related uh, relationship, territorial problems, of course, tourism, cultural tourism and the related form of tourism, because Puglia is very popular as a tourist uh, des destination, social problems, unemployment, aging of farmers, immigration, immigration, and psychological problems because you can imagine that after seven years the farmers are really despaired. I told you that uh, all the olive groves of Puglia represent uh, really the culture of this country, the rural culture, and also the image of the uh, landscape has been damaged severely. What are we talking about uh, tonight, both me and Annake, is about man-made landscapes. We know that European landscapes are very much transformed. In the case of Puglia, uh, the population transformed a very rocky and stony landscapes, making it very fertile. In the Netherlands, where I am uh, tonight with uh, Annake and the other uh, people from the Italian Institute, people have always had to deal with a lot of water, but they still managed to make the Netherlands a very fertile and productive landscape. So two different landscapes, same intervention by men. Well, I said in my text that the transformation belongs to the, the identity of landscapes, to the, to the nature of landscapes, but this transformation happening in Puglia is very traumatic and uh, so and very fast so it's actually not of course not prevented and the consequences are dramatic one of the biggest problem about what is going to happen in the future is about who are the future transformer of this landscape who is actually going to intervene and to change this landscape we now know in uh, in puglia that the farmers is a very aged population. Uh, and uh, another very important issue is that migration, immigration and emigration, because Puglia is a very much a region of Italy where a lot of people move and go away in order to find jobs, uh, brings discontinuity in the population of people working in the fields. Uh, so a lot of people from other countries come and most of the times they are used in the, improperly in the fields. So who are actually the European uh, landscape transformers? But this is not just in Italy, also in the Netherlands and in another, other countries. We know that what, are, what is happening in the, in the world is making a lot of people move in order to find a better place to live. This picture is from 2015. After five years, the situation is always the same. More people are pushing the borders of the EU in order to find a better life. The biggest problem we have in European landscapes, but I would say at least 
very much a big problem in Puglia and in Salento is that uh, there's a lot of unemployment, but still we live in a landscape where not so many people are willing to work. And this is a big problem. Um, actually, landscapes are the confronting mirror of uh, our societies. The way a landscape look and function and they make our lives profitable or not is the mirror of who we are in our societies. Uh, the second part deals with identities and perceptions. Um, this beautiful definition of the European Landscape Convention addresses European people are the as the main, uh, you know, most important part in the actual recognition of the place where they do live. So we as European, we perceive our landscapes and we are supposed to know where we live which is not given for granted. Uh, a big problem when we talk about landscapes, uh, for us, like me and Annika and other people that we work in the landscape field, we are able to understand landscapes. For many people, uh, landscapes are very often uh, mistaken with panoramas. So people consider landscapes only the beautiful landscapes. The rest belongs to a very unclear dimension. This problem comes with the uh, one of the way to study landscape that, it, that is more the aesthetic and perceptive way, uh, but the landscape should be analyzed and studied and uh, considered with many other uh, um, ways. So the ecological approach and the more systematic and structural approach, which really addresses the historical development and so many other issues. I tell you this because uh, one of the biggest problems we have with Xilella is really related to landscape perception. And uh, why? I show you this beautiful uh, picture of uh, Jacob van Rijstel, Hasid of Arlem, this uh, uh, beautiful view on the city of Arlem, because the painting has always influenced the perception of landscape. So, the beautiful landscape painting, in this case of a Dutch uh, famous landscape painter, um, has influenced the fact that we tend to give importance to beautiful landscape and beautiful views. But actually we do perceive landscape through the filter of our uh, knowledge. So, and this is very important because um, what we know and who we are, our culture, our experiences, always interfere with how we perceive landscapes. Talking about the identities of Puglia, from this slide, you can really see that Puglia has a strong uh, identity being a very rural uh, region. Uh, of the surface, of the total surface of the region, you can see that the large amount is used for agriculture. Uh, Puglia is Italian, the Italian main producer of olive oil with over 60 million trees, uh, which means that this problem of Xilella will really affect a uh, big economy, both for the region, but also for Italy. Other two important crops are uh, wheat and vineyards. Uh, we can say that these three crops have always uh, characterize the image of this region. And it's very much like that in many Mediterranean uh, regions. It's the plants that mainly give us food in the Mediterranean diet. So wheat, uh, vineyards and uh, oil. Um, so until 2019, we can say before the, yeah, the biggest consequences of Xilella started, Italy produced almost 50% of the uh, Italian uh, production of olive oil. An important fact is that the olive trees and these olive groves are incredibly beautiful, as you can see here. This beauty is very much recognized by the people from Puglia. Here you see a very beautiful painting uh, by Vincent van Gogh 
uh, Vincent van Gogh painted many olive groves in Saint Remy de Provence. So you can see also in France, uh, they also have, had very beautiful olive trees. When you see the pictures I took and this one, uh, you can see that it's a, it's a kind of uh, landscape that fascinates everybody. As you can see, very spontaneously, farmers are able to produce uh, wonderful uh, land art uh, projects without knowing that. Puglia is an, an immense forest of olive trees, very old and beautiful. The olive tree, uh, since uh, ancient times, has always been recognized of, as one of the most important trees, as uh, Columella already wrote in the Re Rustica. Olive trees belong to the culture of all Mediterranean countries. Uh, as you can see here, there's many uh, products. So not just for eating, producing oil uh, in the kitchen and all the activities related to produce it, producing soap. What is very interesting is that the olive tree is the symbol of the region Puglia. We, I already told you why it's very much present, but it also present in the emblem of the Republic of Italy. As you can see here, there's two plants. One is the olive tree, symbol of fertility and production. The other plant is an oak, symbol of uh, strong, being strong and uh, uh, pride people. So it's, it's a very important tree uh, and it's been there for uh, millennia for us. And Italy has more than 500 varieties of olive trees. Um, the cultivation of olive trees started very um, long time ago uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we can say that the first traces of the cultivation of olive trees uh, started in uh, 3700 uh, before Christ in uh, Palestine and Israel. And then it uh, went westwards first in the area of the Greece and the Aegean islands. And then it arrived in Italy around the seventh century before Christ. Well, since then, Puglia has always been characterized by the presence of olive trees. The, um, you know, um, not always in the same amount, but with uh, sometimes less or more, but the olive trees have always been there. Um, a lot of transformation happened also in the past. We will see later what happened. The port of Gallipoli in the 17th century from the uh, 16th to the 18th century, the port of Gallipoli in Salento became one of the most important uh, port in order to transport and export olive oil. Uh, the olive oil produced in the Salento in those times was mainly used as a lamp oil. Uh, so not a very high quality, but a good quality to be used as a lamp oil or for the textile industry. The port of Gallipoli became an important port for all these Americans, the Venetians, the Genovese, the Americans from Livorno. It exported the olive, uh, lamp olive oil to the port of uh, Marsiglia, but also in the 17th and 18th century, to the ports of the England and coming up to the Netherlands and Hamburg. So the beautiful energy productive in Salento also gave light to the streets of Amsterdam. It's very important to say that there is a very uh, emotional relationship between the trees and the people from Puglia because these landscapes belong to our uh, art, to our identity, our pride and our memories. And I told you before, there is a strong connection between the image and the production in the countryside and the rural settlements and the villages and cities, as you can see here the beautiful view of the city of Ostuni, the, the white city. 
But the real identity, if I can say, uh, of the landscape of Puglia, and this is a good sign for us, because we have to forget a bit the olive trees now, the real identity and protagonist of the identity of the landscapes of Puglia is actually the stone. And this is a good uh, positive perspective for us because the stone will assure us that this landscape will stay uh, alive and that they can, uh, you know, being strong and solid and transformed uh, consciously uh, in the right way, we will give us a future. Uh, this, this landscape has been transformed. As you can see in this picture, the original bedrock has been crushed in order to get soil, uh, fertile soil with the formation of dry stone uh, walls. So the people of Puglia really transformed a rocky landscape, making it a very fertile one. So the landscapes of stones are everywhere in many different ways in the more natural ones, the very extreme ones of the stone quarries, in the terraced uh, landscapes of the Cape of uh, Leuca, as you can see here, where these pockets of fertile soil needs to be filled. So just imagine this picture without olive trees, we still have a landscape, beautiful landscape made of stone and terraced system that needs to be filled with a new crop. And as you can see here, beautiful dry stone elements. It's a, it's a very beautiful structured uh, cultural landscape. And this landscape is the result of a lot of work made by the people of Puglia. Humble work, hard work. And we are somehow nowadays in 2020, a bit of uh, easy lazy people, parasite of an heritage where we didn't contribute at all. But luckily, we do have this beautiful landscape, thanks to our uh, um, four elders. As written here in this beautiful book by Tommaso Fiore, Un Popolo di Formiche, where he um, somehow associates the people of Puglia to the laboriosity of uh, hands. The stone identity of the landscapes of Puglia emerged also with a beautiful heritage we have. This is a very famous Castel del Monte, UNESCO heritage, the beautiful uh, Trulli of Albero Bello also, UNESCO heritage. But I will now address the biggest problem we have. So after seven years, not much has been done. There's two uh, big problems. One is to contain the infection that is moving north. And it's very, uh, we already saw that it's very difficult to, uh, to control. The other problem is to think about what could happen in the future in the damaged landscape of Salenda, because we need to think about the future. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a big discussion. The economy of Salento has always, and the Puglia has always relied on the presence of olive trees. So since centuries, millennia, people have always lived of this economy. So it's very difficult to change it, also to change it in such a short time. So it's, uh, we can understand how reluctant people are to change the way they've always cultivated the fields. Um, I must say that um, this uh, measure by the region of Puglia made in uh, September 2020, so after uh, seven years that the disease started, is uh, proposing to, uh, you know, trying to reconstruct the landscape by planting again olive trees uh, using Two, the two only resistant varieties of olive trees, this FS17 and the Lecino, in order to restore the olive growth entirely. Uh, this measure is very opinable uh, personally, and that is my personal opinion. I think it's not uh, the right uh, way to, to start a program of uh, 
uh, reconstruction of the landscape. The reason uh, why I say this is that I, I love olive trees, I love olive groves, but we have to learn from the problems we faced. So uh, going back to the same monoculture we had is a big problem, but mainly going back with two varieties that are only resistant to the bacterium, but they are not immune. And the resistance of these varieties doesn't mean that they will be productive and that in the long term, they will prove to be productive enough in order to be financed and to be replanted. So it's a bit of a big question mark, you know, to use this uh, olive trees. I, we all know, we do know that we need to help farmers. We need to uh, support farmers, but we also need to guarantee that the landscape will develop again in the right way. So the monoculture has been one of the biggest problem of this uh, infection of the bacterium, you know? A bacterium spreads very easily if it finds only the best food it's looking for and when it doesn't find a biodiversity. Uh, the problem, uh, yeah, we never faced this uh, huge problem of this disease. Many other diseases affected uh, Puglia and the olive groves, but this bacterium is really a terrible one. So it has really destroyed a lot. And the problem is that we got rid of the former forest we had and the bio biodiversity we had before. Unless, uh, although this uh, forest of olive trees that Salento and Puglia has, it's a beautiful forest that many people used as a forest. So a productive forest with many uses, a beautiful, nice shadow, many uses by people. We were very lucky and very happy to have these trees, but somehow it was also very fragile uh, agro ecosystem. And, you know, uh, going back easily to the decision to replant these olive trees, it's uh, somehow it's uh, emotionally uh, people would say, yeah, we need to go back to our identities with those trees, but we also have to be careful and learn from the past. So what is the perspective, the new landscapes, uh, Nuovi Paisaggi? Well, the olive trees were very uh, important also because they had a role also in the a general image of the landscape and also because they were a bit like a buffer between the dispersed city and the conurbation of Salento. And this is a beautiful uh, image by uh, Tomers, which is a Dutch uh, planner, uh, landscape planner, it, and it shows a bit how it works with the olive groves of Salento. And they really were a buffer in, uh, in the dispersed uh, settlements of Salento, or at least they uh, really helped to, uh, yeah, to let the, the urban settlements to be separated. This is a beautiful uh, definition of the um, landscape, the agrarian landscape, uh, very famous in Italy by Emilio Sereni uh, about the agrarian landscape. He says that it's the form that man in the course and the goals for his productivity consciously and systematically impresses on the natural landscape. Uh, actually, this was written in 1960. Uh, in 1962, the EU was created and since then uh, an agricultural, uh, common agricultural policy, which has uh, changed a lot the production, agricultural production, not always in the right ways. Uh, so even though we know that we need to produce because we have a goal and we want to produce because we need to make profit. Some of this profit and some of these crops can also bring problem in the way they are done. Um, hopefully, uh, what is happening in the next years will uh, make a change. Uh, we have positive perspectives when we hear about uh, new concepts, the farm to fork uh, ideas, the next generation EU, and uh, all these uh, objectives uh, we have in order to improve the biodiversity in the landscapes and to give landscapes more attention in the uh, agroecosystems. 
So let's hope this uh, agriculture, common agricultural policy will help also the countryside of Puglia in terms of uh, improving the biodiversity. The signals in the last years were actually the opposite. We can see that, for instance, in Andalusia, in, in Spain, uh, olive groves have become more and more like monocultures. Uh, the, um, as you can see also in the fields, uh, the, it has changed uh, a lot. Also the systems of olive groves, uh, according to density, they have changed a lot. Uh, in Italy, we do have a tradition in, uh, in the olive growth systems where the, we have mainly traditional uh, olive growth, uh, I would say with beautiful cultural landscapes in balance with the landscape. Uh, the economy is shifting towards high density olive growth with more uh, trees uh, per hectare. What we see in Puglia is actually, uh, you know, the densities uh, of the uh, olive groves are very low. Uh, somehow it's very interesting to see this, wh what were the density, the tree densities in ancient olive groves at Roman times. Uh, of course, uh, even less than now, but uh, what we can see is actually that the landscapes of Puglia uh, in terms of their image in the olive groves have not changed so much. Definitely in the last decades, uh, the density has uh, been higher, but somehow uh, we still have this traditional way of uh, cultivating the olive groves. What we see in Spain is that this high density and super high density of olive groves are growing a lot. So the economy is pushing to produce more with more plants per hectare and making these olive groves look more like uh, hedges. So this could be actually the future of the landscapes of Puglia, you know, if we have to follow what's happening in the economy of the olive oil production in order for farmers to be competitive. Actually, we cannot deny that the fact that the farmers need to change their cultivation. Of course, we need to follow what's happening in the world and in the market. So maybe probably the future of Salento will be possibly a combination of traditional forms of olive uh, farming together with more modern and contemporary ways. We cannot just restart by imposing just traditional systems. Of course, all the you know, relationship between people, farmers, countryside and olive growth will change. We nowadays, not anymore see this, but in Puglia, we still have huge trees where people still uh, harvest the olives like this. Uh, it has changed, of course, also in Puglia, we have very professional olive uh, growers. The future can really be this. So just imagine how uh, it will change in, according to the people who have to work and how many people will work in these fields. I will talk about now about the beautiful sentinels we have in the landscape, these huge oak trees. I call them sentinels because they remind us of what the landscape was in the past. Salento was in the past very much characterized by huge uh, forest of uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, oaks. As you can see here in this beautiful uh, atlas, uh, by Antonio Rizzi Zanoni, uh, that was done in uh, at the end of uh, uh, 18th century. So Puglia was characterized by large forests. Here, the famous Bosco di Belvedere. The coast was much more uh, rich of nature and not spoiled. Other other woods were present all the way, as you can see here. In the toponyms you find on these maps, you see a lot of names related to woods and to real nature, to Machis. So the future of many of the landscapes of Puglia can be done by um, reconsidering the ideas of improving the biodiversity of the landscapes 
with the introduction of new forests, like it was in the past. Those forests are needed for the biodiversity, for the use of the landscape, for the recreational use of the landscape, and we have to keep in mind that Puglia is a very touristic region, so we need forest, we need shade, we need nature, we need to see trees. Um, what happened in a neighboring country, Croatia, as you can see here, many fields have been abandoned because the farmers are not cultivating the stone, beautiful stone landscapes they have there. As you can see, nature is actually reconquering those landscapes. Uh, pioneer sp species like Pinus solipensis is uh, actually destroying the cultural landscape. This is also what could happen in Puglia. It's, uh, I found this beautiful uh, video. Uh, we don't have time now to, to watch it. After the Second World War, the Italian government made a program of reforestation. Uh, it's really interesting to say that this reforestation program was done also to uh, reconduce people to the dignity of work, to bring back the landscape to the idyllic beauty, and to win the desolation and the harshness of the landscape. Similarities that happen nowadays after, during this pandemic, and especially after this disease problem. Um, so we need to rethink about the beautiful landscapes of Puglia and the stone landscape will definitely be important for the future of the new developments. What do we need is mainly, yeah, we need to go to a more multifunctional uh, new uh, agroforestry system it's not something new in the landscapes of Puglia. Sometimes new words, new concepts, new names seems to be exceptional. Actually, it's not like that. The landscapes of Puglia were very rich of biodiversity also in the past. What we need to do is definitely go from a mainly separated system of uh, monoculture to a more biodiverse uh, landscapes where uh, Olive growths will have a, a, a big importance. They will definitely be important for the future of the economy because they belong there, they grow well, and we know how to grow them and to transform and make very nice olive oil. But we also need to bring new biodiversity and offer possibility for people to work and to live there. This will uh, uh, also inquire new relationship between the coast and the rural landscape. So bring a new balance between the coast and the rural landscape. Reshape these relationships. We also have to think about the new way to introduce uh, renewable energy with a, with a strategy, with order, and uh, inserting these new elements in the landscape in the right way and creating a new mobility landscape. The problem of xylella is actually not just affecting the olive trees, but it affects a lot of other plant species. And this is the drama of Puglia. So not olive trees, but we are not allowed to use many other species that are important for the agriculture of Puglia. So just imagine we cannot use almonds, we cannot use citrus, we cannot use so many important plants for our economy because they are host plants of the bacterium. So we need to think, researchers need to work, we need to uh, really make a strategy for this landscape. Vineyards can definitely be uh, important for the future, they already are, the, the wines of Puglia are very important. But it was already like that in the past, you know, Puglia, even in this beautiful description of uh, Leandro Alberti in the 16th century, was already described as a very productive landscape, rich of many crops, wheat, uh, olive trees, vineyards, almonds, citrus, lemon, and whatever, all the beautiful fruits of the Mediterranean. So it's not that we need to invent much, we need to rediscover our roots. 
This is a project I did in Lecce, it's in the monastery. I just very rapidly show you some uh, photos because this was a garden that was destroyed of a 17th century uh, monastery and church. It was a productive garden. Even though Xilella was there, initially I used proposed olive trees in the garden. The big drama started exactly when I was doing this project. Well, which I changed it and, you know, the olive trees are present this, in this miserable and sad way as a, you know, awareness bringing element. But the lands, this garden is a productive garden and it means that there are several, still several possibilities to introduce biodiversity and nice crops. Maybe they are not the most favored one in the economy nowadays. Uh, but still, there are many possibilities, as you can see. And these have always been somehow in the rural landscape of Salento. And they are also characteristic of our uh, architecture. You see the Baroque ornaments, they already tell us what, are, what was in the 17th and 18th century, our landscape in the past. Conclusions. Puglia is a very lucky region. We have beautiful uh, landscape plans, provincial, territorial plan, regional landscape plan, very uh, cleverly made. The big problem is the continuity in the planning and the execution of these plans. So there is a lot of knowledge, a lot of expertise. There's a lack of continuity. Uh, a big problem is also that this, uh, these plans, they need to be updated and integrated with the situation of Xilella. And they also need to meet the real problems of society. Uh, the region has, in December 2019, uh, given uh, some University of Puglia the um, possibility to develop a project in the southern part. This is something I heard in the last couple of days. Hopefully they will be able to do something in the next month. Big expectations. Interesting is this Lausanne declaration made in the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the European Landscape Convention because this Declaration asks and addresses the need of landscape integration in sectoral policies. So even if we do need to do restructure the agricultural landscapes, we need to think about the landscape. How important is the landscape in the future uh, strategies? So this needs to be taken into consideration. So, uh, and this is actually what uh, my main thought is. Uh, integrating landscape policies with agricultural policies, with the collaboration of all the actors. There's the future of this landscape it can also only be uh, a bright future only if we face this problem in a multidisciplinary way, collaborating and let, letting all the people work together, give their contribute. It's a big challenge. It needs top-down and bottom-up uh, actions, collective and individual responsibilities, ability to negotiate with the EU, to plan, organize, program, forecast. There's a lot of work. It needs a lot of time and a lot of collaboration in order to build up new values. I, yeah, I'm also done. Uh, I just show you these beautiful frescoes in the Palazzo Publico di Siena because in the 14th century, this uh, Ambrogio Lorenzetti painted in uh, Siena some beautiful frescoes that are very famous for landscape uh, people. You know, it's the effects of good government in the countryside. So a good government make a beautiful, productive countryside. The effect of bad government is not nice uh, landscape. So we all are responsible. I'm almost finished. I thank you very much, Anneke Kainen, 
because she accepted my proposal to the Academy of Architecture to study the problem of uh, Xilella. So we are started together with uh, Jana Creton and uh, some other external expert and this fantastic five students uh, project in order to think about Salento from uh, the Netherlands. I will give now the words to Anneke, uh, just making a, a short consideration about the Italian landscapes and transformation in order to let Anneke show us the differences of the Dutch approach to landscapes transformation. So Italy, I told you a bit with the story of Puglia, is very rich of diversity in landscapes. It is mainly caused by the position of this country in the Mediterranean area. So a crossroads of culture and an extremely diverse uh, geomorphological structure. We do have extremely diversity of landscapes, very much uh, transformed since millennia. You can see the structure of the Centuriation in Veneto, in Emilia Romagna, still present then since Roman times, the beautiful uh, urban landscapes of Venezia, transformation happening now with the Mose. Uh, also here you see the Italian approach a bit more subtle, hiding infrastructures, trying to hide those infrastructures, even they, if they are much more uh, you know, they require a lot of maintenance, probably. Similar landscapes to the Netherlands, probably a lot of contacts with Dutch uh, experts of land, uh, landscape reclamation. Beautiful uh, nature, luckily Italy is endowed with beauty. The rice fields, heritage, the beautiful interaction of men uh, shaping the hills. Uh, nice old girls and vineyards, the urban landscapes of Rome. Italian are very much bound to heritage, to history, to roots. Uh, in some cases, they transform a lot the landscapes, but we are much more conservative than Dutch people. And sometimes being too conservative, it's nice and it's good. We have a beautiful landscape. Sometimes the problems and troubles we have nowadays with climate change will need a different approach also in Italy. So Annika, it's about you uh, to, to tell your beautiful story. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Gianluca, I'm really nice. And thank you for this, this, this nice intermediate introduction. Um, I'll try to share my screen. There we go. That's it. Yes, does everybody see my screen? Yes. Good, excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, thank you. Gianluca, thank you, uh, Paolo, as well, for your uh, introduction. And uh, as uh, Gianluca told uh, you, he has actually asked me to, to say something about um, the Netherlands and the landscape of the Netherlands and the transforming of the landscape that we do here in the Netherlands, just to put it besides um, the, the presentation that he had uh, about uh, Puglia. So I you know, like uh, Gianluca, he could talk for the, the rest of the evening about uh, the beauty of the Italian landscape. And I could talk the rest of the evening about uh, uh, landscape of the Netherlands and, um, uh, and landscape architecture. I won't do that uh, because uh, I would, I'm really looking forward to have a discussion together too. So I'm, I'm doing just a small part of, of the Netherlands as a small part of uh, landscape architecture. So um, Paula already introduced me. I'm Hanneke Kein. I am a landscape architect. I am a designer. Uh, I have my own office at uh, More Landscape. And at the same time, I'm head of the landscape architecture department at the Academy of Architecture. And, uh, and it's really nice to see that uh, some of your students, Gianluca, are already here with us in this online uh, session. So that's really good to, to see. 
Um, and here you see a few of, uh, of the projects that I've been working on, also for my previous uh, office. Um, so I do uh, squares and uh, neighborhoods, uh, public spaces and uh, visions. And on the right hand side, on the bottom, you see an image of a project I just recently finished uh, for an architectural uh, manifestation in Groningen in which we made a vision for a hundred years ahead. So that's a long period ahead to think about. And what we propose there is a, actually a total transformation of the landscape, but um, by doing that, bringing it back to the, uh, to the cultural heritage, which is there and the history, which is there, but transforming the, the agriculture landscape that it is now into a much more diverse uh, agriculture with much more biodiversity and retaining as much uh, fresh water as possible. So that's, that's about me. Um, oh dear. Why is it not going to the next one? Yes, there we go. Um, but for tonight, I will talk to you about uh, the Dutch landscape. And I put together these images on the left uh, is what you see when you arrive, uh, um, or when you fly over Holland and you come uh, coming from a different area. I'm always uh, so um, impressed again by the neatness and the structuredness and the plantness of, uh, of the Netherlands. I, and probably you all have that too. And this image uh, of that landscape together with the cow in the, in the meadows is actually what we see as a sort of identity of the Dutch landscape. Uh, but of course, it wasn't always like that. And I together uh, with that image, I put this image of the painting of another Jacob van Ruysdael, uh, the same painter that you put uh, together. <laughs> Jan Luca, he was a famous uh, landscape uh, painter uh, uh, around uh, uh, the 17th century. And actually, uh, uh, so you can see the difference. It, it used to be probably used to be much wilder and much less uh, uh, planned and man-made at the time. Although he seems also seem to be uh, inspired by the Italian um, landscape painters. So we don't know if this is what actually what uh, the Dutch landscape looked like at the time. Um, but this man-madeness, uh, this, this neatness of the landscape, that is what you really experience if you drive through uh, the Netherlands and, and which strikes you, uh, of course, uh, the most. And which is also very beautiful because it has a certain rhythm and it's, you can uh, read it uh, well and it's very clear. And this is a picture actually by Gianluca. So I, I reckon you also like this sort of uh, landscape. You love it. Or you have come to love it, maybe. Um, but that you, this, this idea of the identity of the landscape has very much to do with the polders that we have uh, in the Netherlands, um, which is actually an ultimate form of man-made or artificial culture landscape. And the whole of the Netherlands is, is built up uh, of these polders, or the most of the Netherlands. And I found this image which explains it quite well because it's, it's, it's uh, so this is a really old system, the polder system. And um, as the Netherlands is a very lie lowing uh, land, of course, it was a, uh, with a lot of uh, rivers and water. So it was a very uh, a wetland. And uh, with the invention of the windmills, which was actually around 12 years ago, facevano muovere queste pale e le pale da energia eh, pro, eh, produceva energia che serviva poi per eh, scopi agricoli. Cioè, capisci, tutto... Eh, ma no, energia per venderla. Ok. I, can, I will uh, continue with that. <laughs> I hope that was about the windmills. <laughs> If not, uh, uh, I will just continue about the windmills. It was, it was. Ah, good. <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> so the, the, the windmills was actually an invention that we did uh, around 1200. So, so from then on, we used the windmills in the Netherlands to pump up the water. And, and with this pumping of water, we could, of course, make this land uh, a dry land and make it an arable land uh, suit for uh, uh, agriculture. So that's, that's what happened. Uh, um, the Dutch made all these polders and uh, put uh, with a dike around it, of course, first the dike, put the, the windmill on top of it and then pump up the water so you could have a, a dry land which you could uh, put agriculture on. Uh, and that helped us or the Dutch to be experts in this system of uh, making 
inland, and, uh, uh, this system of the water system, which was quite an expertise in which they evolved uh, year by year. Um, and of course, now we don't use the windmills anymore, but uh, we use modern pumps uh, or a gamal. Uh, but the complication of this water system has become more and more. So in these polders, it used to be one water system, but now more and more in, within polders, there's even uh, a couple of uh, separate water systems. And that's also uh, another separate system from the, the, the upper water system. So anyway, that's about the polders. And uh, um, a lot of that, the polders also came about because we had uh, peat soils in the Netherlands, lots of peat soils also because we are a wet uh, country and uh, peat grows on, on wet soils. Um, and here you see how that happens. So on the left, you see a, a picture of uh, Scottish peat extraction. They still do it there. Uh, so the peat is, is extracted and uh, put aside. And uh, when the peat is dry, it's turf, and you can, that what's, is what happened. They burnt it uh, as a sort of, uh, as an energy. Uh, but in the Netherlands, because the groundwater level is so high, as soon as you extract that peat, uh, the land becomes uh, water. So all the, the, the land where the peat was extracted uh, became those polders uh, by putting the windmills and uh, pumping out the water. So um, here you see an image of uh, all those uh, uh, or a few of the polders that we have in the Netherlands. And I really like this image because you see so well how it works. So you see the outline of the polders and that's the dike. And then within the polders, every polder has its own rational system of, of diagonal uh, lines and, and very functionally uh, made landscape to, uh, for the, the agriculture. And so that's a very typical Dutch uh, invention. Uh, and we have uh, 3000 in total, says Wikipedia. So that's uh, true. And it, uh, it adds up to half of the Dutch uh, surface, apparently. And in this map, you see uh, two quite famous uh, boulders, the Schermer and the Beemster, of which the second one is a World Heritage, uh, UNESCO World Heritage site. Um, but I also want to show you this, uh, uh, this bigger, even bigger land reclamation projects that we did in the Netherlands. So uh, the Dutch became more and more the, the water experts of the land reclamation experts. And what they did, um, yeah, the, this last century is uh, that they made these huge uh, land reclamation projects. And it started off with the, the Afsluit uh, dike, as you can see on the left, and that controlled this, this big body of water, which we had at the time. So on the left, you see the, actually it's the map of, uh, of Holland at the time uh, when we still had this huge body of water called the Zuiderzee. Um, and there were already quite for quite some time plans to uh, to control this water by a big dike, uh, but they were helped. The planning makers were helped by a flood, which happened in 1916. So it was a severe flood, and that uh, really caused for the plans to to come about uh, uh, more um, towards construction. And this was the big, yeah, the, the father of the plans at the time, Cornelis Lely. He was a technical engineer. And at the same time, he was the minister of water management. So we actually made a law in 1924. And the drawing on the left went with the law uh, to, to make this project uh, happen. Uh, it's quite a technical uh, uh, drawing, as you can see. Uh, Cornelis Lely didn't live up to see uh, the construction made, but uh, he, he certainly initiated it. So it started with the Afsluit Dyke, um, and this, this is actually a huge project for that time. So it's a 32 kilometers long dike, and here you can see the finalizing of it. So uh, getting together the two lines of the dike and closing it off. Um, and they did it in only five uh, years with, with all the machinery that they had at the time. Uh, but only not only the machines they used, but it was definitely also a very um, man-made uh, system. Um, so quite something. Uh, but then they went on. So that was in, in 19 from 1925 to 1932. They did the Afsluit Dyke, and on the left you can see that was also the time of the first land reclamation. So the, the Viering Randmeer, it's called. It's not too big, but the second one, uh, which they finished in 1942. So that's actually in the middle of the Second World War was the North Oost folder. I'll show you a bit more later on in the presentation. And the last one, the biggest one, 
is in uh, the, is the Flavo polder uh, in 1960. Um, and um, here you can see what happened uh, from then onwards. So uh, yeah, the land reclamation was done to, to get more uh, agriculture land. But as you can see in the development, it's, it's also become quite important for urban settlements. And now that's the image on the right. Uh, we're making plans uh, within uh, the program of the, uh, the MRA, the Metropolitan Region of Amsterdam, in which Almere and Lelystad, so that's the two big cities uh, on the Flevo polder, or as we now call it Flevoland, the province of Flevoland, have a big uh, uh, role. So uh, we are planning outside of Amsterdam into this uh, Flevoland. And uh, in all maps, it looks as if, if these big, huge uh, uh, pieces of land have, have always been there. But actually, that's like the Flavo border, that's, that's the, uh, supposedly the biggest man-made island uh, on Earth, 970 kilometers, square kilometers. Actually, I just checked uh, in comparison with Buglia, that's, that's nothing. But uh, <laughs> as a land reclamation site, that's quite something. And now we have 317,000 inhabitants in the Flavo uh, border. So... Um, but going back to the North Oost border, so this was finished, or the land reclamation was finished uh, uh, in the middle of the Second World War, but of course, uh, I, I presume they started uh, um, yeah, using it after the Second World War, and you see how they designed it at the time. Um, very interesting, it's very, it's very man-made, very functional, so what they did is that they designed a line, a road, on which they spaced the farmlands or the farms along it, and, and long lines, of rows of trees along that road. Then you have agriculture parcels, and then at the end you have the, the water system, so the water line, and this they repeated uh, uh, one after the other. Uh, so, yeah, it's a sort of... Uh, um, yeah, everything is, is designed and, and planned for and thought of in a sort of a functional, rational way. Um, and this is what you see now. It's, it's yeah, it's a beautiful uh, country and, and you see all those rational lines uh, when you drive through it. And you also see the, the agriculture that's, uh, uh, that is there now. And I think the, um, the industrialization of our agriculture in, in the Netherlands started in that sort of, uh, that period probably. And um, uh, it's a beautiful picture. I love, uh, I love these flowers, but at the same time, it also hurts a bit because uh, uh, yes, here also we have this, uh, this monoculture um, and um, to get these uh, um, flowering, um, these bulb flowers uh, uh, growing here, they probably need a lot of insecticides and uh, they probably really uh, yeah, used up all the, the fertile uh, fertility in the ground. I don't think there's a lot of uh, life anymore in this soil. So yes, uh, beautiful, but it also needs uh, transforming. So yeah, in, it, for that, uh, we have some, the same sort of uh, troubles uh, here in the Netherlands as uh, in Italy. Um, but what they also did at the time when they planned this, uh, the North Oost border is that is they planned society as well on how we should live together. A uh, very interesting. So they not only put the farms along the road, but they also put a few of those farms together and uh, thinking that people would start a sort of small community. And that same counts for the, the, the village of Nagele, which is a, a sort of model city, very, very interesting to have a look a lot, uh, at when you're there. Um, it's still in the same way that it's, uh, it was designed at the time, and it was uh, designed by, uh, most of it was designed by the famous architect Aldo von Eyck, um, together with his team. Um, and this is really in the in the the building up of the country in the in the the modernistic uh, uh, design flow. So uh, it's a, sort of a very democratic way of designing. So everybody uh, had had to have the same sort of ri uh, rights and the same opportunities and uh, the same amount of green and light in their houses and. Uh, even the distance to the supermarket was equal for everybody. If you would be poor or rich, uh, you would have the same chances. So it's very, not only the landscape is very uh, makeable, thought makeable, but also the society at the time. 
Then there's another thing which is, uh, is, is fun to talk about and to, to tell you, I think. Um, that's two islands which were there in the Zuiderzee at the time before the land reclamation called Urk and Schok Schokland. You see them on the top image. Uh, that was uh, uh, when there were still islands. Uh, and on the bottom left, you can see uh, what happened. So they were completely swallowed up in this, uh, this land reclamation pattern and structure. And um, even now on the map on the right, you can see, uh, Uric, you can't see very much still the, the island which was there, but Schokland you can see, still uh, uh, see. And when you're there, um, you can still see it. So that's, that's quite a, a nice thing to see as a relic of, uh, of history. So on the top, you see the, the island as it was when it was still an island. And now it's still an island, but an island in, in the rational landscape. Um, and it's, it's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it, it's good fun to, uh, to have a look at. It has a small uh, museum and the outlines of the islands, you, it's still very uh, accessible and uh, experienceable. And also the, the height difference, of course, when you're there, it's very uh, expressive. And there's a road going uh, straight over the island. So if you don't know it, you, you probably don't see it. But if you do know it, you, you experience this, this height uh, difference and you see the island coming up to you and leaving again. It's very, very uh, uh, special. Um, so those land reclamation sites were mostly done to, to gain in agricultural land um, because there was a, a, yeah, we had to have a more fertile land to, to produce more uh, agriculture crops. Um, but now, um, and closer to home, we also use sort of land reclamation sites for, uh, for expanding the city. So as you'll see, probably this is Eiburg, uh, expansion of Amsterdam in the same water, the same uh, Cydersee, uh, previous Cydersee uh, waters, uh, which is completely um, a reclamation uh, land site. But uh, what I want to show you is actually sort of the downside of all our expertise. And that has to do with this, the, the Dima Park. So that's next to, uh, or in between Eiburg and Diemen on the, on the bottom side here. Uh, and it consists of a long dike, the Diemen Dike, um, along that side, the, the Amsterdam Rhine Canal here. And uh, what I want to tell you about is, is the green space just north of that, where you see the sports uh, fields, because uh, that's what you see. The history of that is what you see here. So here you see this this uh, man on his solex, on his moped. He's he's standing on the dike, on the Dima dike, and on the left, so the green fields that you saw in the previous picture, were actually a landfill uh, until 1982. So that's not uh, not too long ago. Uh, and it was not only household waste that they uh, put there, but uh, very uh, chemical waste too. And what you see here is the burning of this uh, chemical waste. So it's, it's very toxic waste. And what the Dutch did with all their uh, expertise of, of making a uh, landscape is, is that actually put a box around this. That's what you see in the scheme on the right. Uh, it's, it's sort of a black box around this, uh, this toxic waste. And they covered it up with one meters of soil. And, and yeah, it's there um, to keep. Uh, but because we have this, uh, this really high groundwater level, of course, what we don't want is the groundwater to come in through this toxic waste and contaminate uh, the environment around it. So um, in this uh, black box, there's a pump and it's pumping 10 to 14 cubic meters water per hour. And uh, they will probably do that for the rest of uh, till eternity because uh, there's no plan to to get really get rid of all this uh, toxic waste. So that's the sort of um, solutions, uh, the downside of the, of the expertise that we have, I think, in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, then another thing that's the other thing that we do in the Netherlands because yeah we we are experts in this and that also means that we try to find out new things um, and here you see uh, the, what we do for a coastal defense uh, in the Netherlands is that we we put a lot of sand suppletion there so we we get the the sand from further on in the sea and we get it close to the coast and we put it on the beach or uh, very close to the beach and that's um, that prevents the coast uh, to be flooded. Um, 
And what they did in this case, in the, in the sand motor, it's called, it's close to, close to the Hague and uh, at Katwijk, is that they, they, they got all the sand together from, uh, for, that was planned for the sand suppletion for 10 or 15 years or something, and they put it together and they put it all at once in this uh, place. And they did that because they wanted to experiment and, and see what happened uh, if they would do that. And what happens is that uh, nature, so the sea and the wind, actually uh, uh, is used to to um, to spread the sand, and by doing that, uh, making a defense of the coast. So th this is a very interesting way of of coastal defense, but also of of experimenting to seeing uh, how nature can help you in a system, in a natural system, uh, for something that you want as a country like this uh, coastal defense. Uh, close to that is, is another uh, region that I want to show you. Um, and again, this is a, a very much a monocultural uh, land. So this is called the Westland, uh, a bit to the south of uh, The Hague. And this is uh, totally, this landscape is totally covered with uh, glass houses. So there's not a lot of space left for living or for uh, nature here. Um, and it, of course, it has nothing to do with the landscape uh, uh, on which it is uh, standing. And I'm showing you also because uh, at exactly this, uh, uh, this area, there used to be this uh, really nice palace and estate owned by the, the, royal, the Dutch royal family. Uh, and it was uh, built in 1600, Dijk, it's called. And it was demolished uh, around 1850. So um, only a, a very small piece of a building is left over. Uh, so that's that's what the Dutch do with our uh, cultural heritage. Um, and I'm showing you this because uh, we are using this area for our students, for our first year students. Uh, um, and they're going to do a design project uh, in this area to transform this, uh, this agriculture area into a much more sustainable um, agriculture area, but also because we want them to work on, on the history on the landscape uh, itself. Um, and that's actually what we always do with our students. We really want them to work on, on urgent uh, uh, themes in the landscape architecture. Uh, so this is, for instance, another project that uh, our students did last year. This is uh, where they uh, made the designs for um, for existing pig farms in Brabant. And uh, yeah, we need, we definitely uh, a big transformation of that uh, agriculture land over there because uh, there we have uh, extreme large emissions of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, nitrogen. So uh, here we, we gave our students one parcel of a, a pig farm to transform into. And here you can see a few examples of, of what those students think of. And of course, that's really nice because they're, they're very free in, in thinking of, uh, of new ways of transforming this, uh, this landscape. So that, that always helps a lot to, to, um, to discuss this with uh, all sorts of different stakeholders. So here you see a student uh, making a forest for the pigs, uh, a very autarkic uh, new landscape with a very sustainable um, agriculture, but also the second one is about uh, producing energy. Um, and in this case, it's algae and uh, energy. So that's very um, a new way of, uh, of making energy. And I have another one, another student's project with me um, for now. And that's, that's, this is a graduation project by Roland Meek. He graduated last year. And what he did is he, uh, he had a look at the area around the city of Utrecht uh, to try to see if he could make transform this landscape around Utrecht to, to provide all the food necessary for the whole of the city of Utrecht, but then in a sustainable uh, circular agriculture way. And that's what he did. And he made this huge model that you can see here in which he, he actually um, projected uh, one agriculture parcel uh, to see uh, what that looks like, this new uh, circular agriculture system, as you can see here. But so it's, it's completely different than uh, what we are used to, uh, what the landscape looks like uh, at this moment. 
and that's uh, that's where my my presentation uh, ends for tonight. Um, and that is about the, the future of the Dutch uh, landscape. And uh, yeah, we need to transform it. So we we really need to see how we are going to do this, but how to get this uh, this landscape of ours much more uh, diverse and uh, uh, more biodiversity and uh, uh, to keep the fresh water uh, in the area itself. So. Thank you, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I think I need to stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you, Hanneke. Thank you, Gianluca. It was absolutely very interesting, fascinating. We got some questions here. Um, I, I, would, I would retain a few. Um, one, for example, uh, is uh, about, for Gianluca, I guess, is about the in European incentives uh, meaning the contributions apparently, uh, we're talking about the Puglia, of course, are more on the ownership of the, of the trees uh, rather than on a production of olives. The, if, uh, does this have an, a, a consequence or what's your opinion on this? And I have another question, I will say it right away so we don't lose time for Haneke, uh, which is... Uh, um, what would you import, let's say, from the uh, Italian way of uh, managing landscape, which is, of course, much more conservative, uh, in order to, um, in Holland, uh, which is more industrialization versus harmony and cultural heritage? What would you import, if any, from the Italian uh, way of managing the landscape. So Gianluca and Haneke. Gianluca, the microphone. Yes, thank you for the question. It's a very uh, important and crucial question because it's, uh, it's a bit what I said in my presentation. The mm, common agricultural policy has actually um, made a system of uh, help for uh, farmers that has somehow a bit uh, made the system dependent on the help of this contribution that comes from the EU. Uh, which means that a lot of uh, profitable uh, cultures of the past or that were you know present in the past and they were traditional and uh, also successful in the past with this contribution uh, the agricultural system has changed and all the economies have changed and not always in the right way, I must say. Uh, this means that a lot of farmers can actually survive only if they get this money. And a lot of farmers, the, the land property in Salento and in Puglia is very uh, fragmented. Uh, there is a high pulverization of the land property. So very small farms, very old farmers, and all dependence on money coming from the EU. So the future is trying to first to talk to people, let people participate, let people cooperate, let them see if they want to go further with farming or otherwise people have to join their force and find new way of cultivating the landscape. You know, I fragmented landscape properties and very old farmers and the dog system of contribution coming from uh, far away will not make our landscapes more productive and more livable. So the, it, it needs a radical change. And that's why in my conclusion, I said that it's very important that we are able to discuss with the top uh, sector how to change this structure, how to change these mechanisms. Otherwise, it will never be possible to make any change. So it, it will definitely need a change, uh, but it, it is also a political program. Eh? It's a political uh, uh, idea that all European have to face. I mean, also in the Netherlands, it's a bit the same, you know, farmers are always protesting, even in the Netherlands. So it's a common vision that needs to be changed. 
I think the question, can I add to that, Paula? The question yes. is also about um, um, responsibility and, and property, yeah? uh, because there's a theory that if you if you change the idea of property, so you um, you take you don't take the property of the olive trees, but the property of the olives as a profit, then you would take better care of the olive trees. That's a sort of idea, and the same thing counts for, of course. Uh, the earth or the landscape, if, if that's not somebody's property, but what you do on, on the landscape is somebody's uh, property or somebody's profit, then uh, the responsibility for the earth or the planet or the landscape is much more common. So um, that's a sort of interesting way of thinking of how you could change, you know, it's a sort of mindset. Eh? We, we really need uh, everybody to, to, to understand uh, the value of, of what we have, of what we have with the planet, of the landscape and, and the nature. And, and this is one of the theories of, that could change uh, that. Yes. And this, this question is very relevant, you know, and it's a bit what I said in my text about the policy making, you know, you can make beautiful policy and plans, but actually the reality is then addressed to the farmers and sometimes farmers are, are not even able to give an interpretation to what we plan for them, you know, it's a, we need to make everything a bit more accessible and more equal, uh, you know, uh, to give a bright future to our uh, landscapes somehow. Yeah. Shall I jump the, towards the second uh, question, uh, Paolo? Yeah, that's a really nice question. I like that because uh, we have a sort of comparison uh, with the, the, the Italian uh, way of looking at landscape and the Dutch way. And so the question is, uh, what what would would we like to import from the Italian way of uh, of looking at the landscape? And I think part of that is the, is maybe the love for the landscape uh, itself, eh? because the way you talk about it, Gianluca, and the way you talk about about the stone and the material, uh, it's rarely so that I, I hear Dutch people talking about the soil. And it's even so that for my last project in Groningen, we talked to farmers. Uh, and the interesting thing is that they, uh, the, the people that we talk to, they, they really do their best eh? because it, it's quite hard to be a farmer these days. But I ask them, so um, what is your, your attachment to the soil here? What is your attachment to the landscape here? And, and uh, they actually say, yes, yes, we really attach to farming and to, to be one with the landscape. But if you talk on further and you ask them really about the landscape, itself which is there uh, then they uh, quite fast say yeah yeah but if it's not possible here you know uh, we could change a uh, move to elsewhere and, uh, and be a farm farmer somebody somewhere else so the attachment to the landscape in itself i think is is much less here than uh, what i hear from you uh, in the italian landscape so yeah I, if, if it were up to me, and it's not, of course, I would really like to import this love for the landscape or for the identity of the landscape or for the soil of, uh, of the landscape into, into the Dutch uh, thinking, way of thinking. Yes. Nice, nice question. It's, uh, I, I, I think Dutch people are much more uh, used to transformations and radical transformations. It, it also belongs to the culture, you know, and to the actually how difficult the Dutch landscape is because of the presence of water. Uh, it's, it's another uh, yeah, mentality and need. And uh, because also the reclaimed landscapes in Italy are a bit in the direction of Dutch landscapes. So the, the, the actual uh, identity of landscapes makes also and the, the way of thinking people uh, people uh, uh, diff yeah become different you know the uh, the actual uh, resistance of the landscape to activities you yeah. know? So it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's well well, there were some more questions, but <clears throat> for Gianluca, for example, I think you've uh, replied to some during your presentation, like there was somebody saying that the solution should be an agriculture with biodiversity and dry agriculture mainly. So I think you talked about that. And there was another quite interesting point, a person asking, um, about the trees that are uh, being, uh, that are dead, 
they should maybe they could be uh, go into the handicraft sector and be used uh, uh, to have a second life. Yes, well, that that is uh, that has been addressed uh, many times. There are actually some uh, people making a nice piece of furniture because you can uh, you can imagine that this beautiful. Uh, uh, trunks. They are, yeah. I said before, they are like living sculpture. Uh, they can be used in uh, some certain subtle ways because they, uh, these beautiful old olive trees, can also connect, uh, contain in the uh, inside some uh, you know cavities or discontinuity. So to make perfect uh, uh, objects, they are not the the right ones. But you can make beautiful, unique. Uh, handicrafts objects, that's for sure. Um, so that there is definitely a future. And I think they did also design competitions, but definitely there are some uh, people already working on that. So, and the, we know that the olive uh, wood is also very beautiful wood. So it's, uh, there is definitely a future for that. Two more questions quickly before we go, I have them here. Uh, one person is uh, uh, afraid that the olive trees might be replaced by solar panels. Is there a possibility on this? And the last one is for Haneke. Uh, somebody asking, is there maybe a change in a cultural approach that would stop land reclaiming in uh, Netherlands? I leave you with these two. Gianluca. Okay, the, the solar fields, maybe we can both uh, answer because I think it's a problem also in the Netherlands. So, but we will both answer. Yeah, you know, it's, it's about the policies. It's important that we have good policies that say what can we do with the renewable energies and how much renewable energies we need. So first quantify, define rules and the, the important thing is that we are able to receive proposal, but to react them professionally. So we need to say yes and no with rules, with strategies, and not considering all the proposals singularly. Otherwise, it will be a mess. Definitely, what we don't need to do, especially in Salento, is to spoil the fertile land that we have because we saw that the those fertile fields have been worked out with tough uh, work by our ancestors so we need to be uh, use a multifunctional way to insert these solar panels because we have flat roofs we had a lot of industrial areas we have to be smart by uh, trying to insert these renewable energies. Definitely not in the way it's been done in the past, like very casual, very chaotic, and very, you know, uh, searching for a, a way, because the expertise is there. And, uh, you know, it, it can be done in a very uh, nice and interesting way. We can create new landscapes with that, as Anneke has already showed us. Actually, I want to add to that because there, there was another really uh, interesting graduation project at the Academy last year, and that was by uh, Sika van der Berg, and she proposed to use the windmills because we are, we're now we're planning uh, heaps and heaps of windmill farms in the North Sea, uh, and she found out, you know, um, that by placing these windmills, you could make a totally new underwater sea landscape. So she, she designed, she uh, made designs for the foot of the, the windmills uh, on the bottom of the sea, because the bottom of the sea, we really, uh, there's, there's not a lot of life there anymore, eh? because we fished out all our seas, so the, the bottom of the sea is very lifeless. So she made a new design for these uh, foot of the feet of the, of the windmills, uh, making a totally new uh, landscape under the water and adding lots and lots of uh, uh, new biodiversity there. So. Um, I always think, uh, so yes, we have to produce energy in a different way. And how can we uh, do that in such a way that we add value uh, in some way or other? So that I found that a really nice uh, project uh, um, with a good answer to this, uh, to this uh, assignment that we have. Uh, and then answering, um, uh, that's a really nice question too. And I also saw uh, a question about um, 
the plan Lievense, and that's actually about a, a plan. If you really uh, watched the, the images that I showed closely, you saw that there was a, a fourth uh, land reclamation site uh, planned at the time uh, after the Flevopolder, and that's the Markewaard. So, um, and that would uh, almost close off this whole Isomera area. Uh, um, but in the 1980s, I think around that time, it was uh, opposed again, against. And um, Hugo is asking us uh, uh, if that was the end because there was a discussion about uh, man versus nature, about the land reclamation. It, it was part of that uh, discussion, but it's also, uh, that was an interesting uh, discussion at the time. It was, it was also about the identity of Holland and that we, as Dutch people, we, we, our identity is also this big, uh, large uh, body of water. So eventually uh, uh, the plan didn't go through. And the plan Levens is actually an interesting one also from that time the 1980s around that it was a time to use this space as a sort of energy buffer uh, to to buffer energy uh, of, of electricity in this uh, area within a, a sort of very interesting engineering uh, uh, plan but that it all didn't go through um, and if that is a, a, a difference uh, uh, in attitude between man and nature, yes, maybe it's the start of a discussion that we uh, we started at the time that we, we saw or we started to see that, uh, uh, yeah, it's not uh, man controlling nature, but we have to coexist. So, uh, uh, yes, I think uh, that's it. Well... Uh, it's been really interesting, uh, I think, and I hope our participants are satisfied. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you for the people who followed us up to now. And uh, I hope we will maybe continue a discussion live sometime in the future. And uh, thank you, every thank you, everybody. And uh, good evening. And thank, thank you, you so too. Much. It was really nice. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.